When I talked about home, I talked about the chicken pig. It was a wood slat barbecue hut about the size of a Taco Bell overlooking Mission Gorge Road. That's how I remember it, at least, and memory is all I have to go on. I never took a picture of it when it existed. There's nothing online I've looked, and the whole of the city of Santee got buried under strip mall redevelopment sometime in the early aughts. So if it isn't for my insistence, the whole place may have never well been. Nothing about the chicken pig would have made an impression if it weren't for the giant pig that was perched up on its roof. The pig wasn't what made it important to me, though. It just drew the eye towards it. My problem was with the fucking apostrophe. That's what I talked about, see, when I talked about the chicken pig, that it wasn't spelled chick and pig, but chick in apostrophe pig. <laughs> so what you had was a plastic pig writing a misused apostrophe on a barbecue hut in Santee. And that was the straw that buried an innocuous little business under the hey riot hoot nanny of stereotype that I grew up resenting about East County. See, it's all fun and games looking back now, but growing up in the shadow of the chicken pig, that was fucking terrifying. <laughs> that fucking apostrophe lit up my adolescent night like a middle finger pointed in the hopes of ever getting out. <laughs> under that apostrophe, every teenage girl was just one unprotected load of semen away from just scrubbing fat out of a rotisserie the rest of her life. Every teenage boy was just one blown math test off from being forced into a uniform either made out of a paper hat and an apron or army drab. <laughs> and the pig, that fucker smiled because he knew we would all become as morbidly obese as he was in time. <laughs> he knew we had no money for nice dude. He knew our grocery stores knew quantity and not quality. And we would partake of his dotty out of desperation. His meat would stop up our hearts like tampons flushed down a toilet. And when we died, he would cater our funeral. <laughs> Projecting fears was a major creative outlet in the 80s. Most people feared the Russians. I feared the pig. <laughs> the pig became the mascot in my eyes for the good old boy hick horseshit that got Santee named Clan T over its perceived acceptance of neo-Nazi culture. Even as a kid, I knew we were not being branded in an especially charming light. <laughs> now, the weird thing, though, was as much as I identify with growing up in East County, most of the time we lived a good 10 miles away over in San Carlos. Every morning, my grandfather, he drove as far west as a person could on dry land to go to work at a sub base over in Point Loma. But other than a trip to the commissary and a beauty parlor on Fridays, my grandmother, she could not be bothered. My clothes came exclusively from the Parkway Plaza Mervins in three different colors of whatever style was on sale. The rare dinner out was almost exclusively reserved for the hometown buffets of El Cajon or Santee, whichever one Grand decided was fancier at the time. <laughs> and I loved every minute of it. My grandmother's friends' houses were rural with plenty of space to play in. I got to go to Marshall Scotty's on my birthday. And there always seemed to be old people around with candy of indeterminate age. But then I became a teenager in the mid-90s and needed something to sneer about. The television show Cops had soared in popularity and in so doing popularized the term trailer trash. Uh, people, will always get a fr people will always get away with making fun of poor people. That's what my grandmother heard when she heard trailer trash. She heard poor people. Some of those trailers are pretty nice. And when you're just starting out or getting to be old, you know, you don't need a lot of space. But everybody's got to look down on somebody. Solidarity was what kept my grandmother driving east every day in the opposite direction of manifest destiny. Like everybody else we knew in San Diego, my grandmother had come from somewhere else. She'd come out of Harrison, Arkansas, by the Missouri state line. It still makes news from time to time because of the hijinks of the Klansmen who live there. <laughs> World War II answered her prayers by opening up jobs for women, and she went west with her mother at the age of 19 to San Diego in a job with a telephone company as a switchboard operator in the gas lamp. She became a good Navy wife, traveled the world, and wound up back here in her 40s and settled for good. Most of the time I'd spent growing up with her, I'd s assumed her stubborn loyalty to East County had something to do with her being a bargain hunter. And while it was true things were cheaper east of the 15, the draw for her was a lot subtler. She didn't go east just because things were cheaper. She went for the poverty that motivated it and made her feel at home. Plenty of her East County friends were middle class, 
There's tons of them out there. But there was a style of poverty in that region that she found kinship with, a type that was different from other to, to be found in other parts. And it, it was a fashion that she affectionately referred to as raggedy ass. <laughs> now, my grandmother never told me outright when I was growing up how bad her childhood had been. I knew it without knowing it the same way that we usually meet our friends and our lovers' childhood abuses through a stiffened hug or a story cut short. The way she saved everything and she splurged on nothing. One evening, she made me watch an episode of 60 Minutes that she'd taped. It was about a Romanian orphanage where all the babies had learned to stop crying because no one had ever come to comfort them. Afterwards, she said to me, you know, the homeless folks out there we passed, they're like that. And she was right. So many that we saw while we were riding around, so many of her friends, it turns out, they didn't bother with signage or begging. They just were. Leather brown, creased, waiting, it seemed, for something to come and take them away. Every one of them knew the cavalry would not be coming. My grandmother was neither God-fearing nor prone to guilt. It was neither the bribery of heaven or self-hatred that drew her to him. It was kinship. Where she was from, these folks were. These were her people. Once I got older and more independent, she got to fixing on one of these wandering figures at a time. How she picked them, I never figured out, but she had plenty to choose from. Reagan had just ended institutionalized compassion for their kind a few years before. So the market was flooded, so to speak. She never did learn the name of the first friend she made. That poor old feller was all she called him. He was a bearded, shambling wreck of a man, his white shirt in tatters and black pants torn open, and he carried a colostomy bag as he wandered ceaselessly across a 100-degree pavement. But it was a modern allegory, biblical, wretched. He had her attention for the better part of a year before he disappeared. She pulled over every time she saw him and told me to wait in the car back when I was young, and every time it was the same. She'd approach and say soft words, and he'd turn his head away and raise his hand up over his face like he was scared she'd take to beating him with a $20 bill that she held out before him. In the end, though, he'd always take the money before she turned back to the car, but neither she nor I could swear if he had enough sense left to remember how to use it. It wasn't really for him, though. She looked a long time for after he vanished. It was kind of like from what I could notice, like her holding out somehow was keeping him alive and moving on was going to be killing the dead man all over again. So here's to that poor old feller, as she would say. But after him came Patsy. Patsy was always sitting on a bus stop and never rode the bus. She could have passed at first glance, no bags, no car, just some faded old clothes that were always too warm for the weather. But Gran had her number, though. My daughter is coming in a couple of weeks. That's what Patsy would chirp with her sweet little old lady smile each and every time Grand found her. I asked my grandmother once if she thought Patsy's daughter even existed. Maybe, she said, maybe they lost touch. Maybe she's dead. All I know is for certain she's not coming. Patsy took, took Grand's money as cordially and without ceremony as if she'd been offered a helping of peach cobbler, and it hurt Grand the worst when she went away. There were others who followed, but the September after I graduated in 1999, I finally won my battle against the pig, became intolerable to be around, and moved to New York City for college. <laughs> New England may as well have been England for how different things were to me. For one, I'd never gone and met old money before. Once I did, my favorite quote was from a non-ironic wearing sweater vest from New Jersey who announced, yeah, you know, if this art house thing doesn't work out, I'll just move back home and either take over a family business or run for office. <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't have a plan B. I obviously still don't. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the kids around me found my stories from home amusing, and I just milked them like a clown. The stories like I told about the chicken pig, chicken pig, but I got put in my place within that first month. After I invited a prospective date over for dinner, I presented her with the Rice Krispie fried chicken recipe that I thought was a star growing up. <laughs> and she looked at it and responded, Oh my God, you really are white trash. <laughs> People will always get away with making fun of poor folks. I lived in New York City for nearly 10 years, 
and all I ever wrote about was he's counting. My grandmother died in 2005. I moved back in 2008. My grandfather needed help moving into assisted living after he got the Alzheimer's. And more and more of my time was spent in East County out of preference. There, the facial hair was not ironic. The lard, not artisanal. <laughs> and to my knowledge, except for one, who I'm very proud is in the audience tonight, there are no mixologists. It is a guileless country. Its people struggled for more than they were given, and it turns out it was my home without my ever having to ever had choose it. Thank you so much. It's Justin Hudnall, everybody.